Okay, so thanks for coming. We have Alberto Dion today. He's going to talk about interpolating sequences, which are um, very fascinating and sort of enigmatic. So I'm excited to hear what Alberto is going to share with us. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all the organizers who gave me a chance to be here today and, and talk and uh, to, uh, to actually to, put, uh, to organize such a nice uh, thing like Hotter. I think it's a very nice idea and I'm very, very glad that I'm part of it. And um, yes, as a Chris was saying today, I'm going to talk about briefly uh, about interpolating sequences, which is such a like a, a classic and very well known subject, at least for HMC on the disk. And in particular, I, I, I would like to put the emphasis on this kind of um, other approach to interpolating sequences that is given by using um, some Hilbert spaces and some of their multiplier algebra. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to try to share what I know about it in a, like a very brief and like introductory way today. And so the, the, the first thing that I would like to start with is like um, talking briefly about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And uh, of course, one can give a, a, a talk only on that if you wanted, but I'm not going to do that, of course. I'm just going to give some basic notions, some basic introduction. In particular, I'm just going to say that if X is a domain on CD and H is a Hilbert space of a holomorphic function on X, then H is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. If the evaluate if for any X in the, in the domain X, the evaluation function of it is, is bounded. So if for any x, the function e x, which goes from h to c, that just does nothing but sending any function f to f of x, is bounded. Anyway, if my handwriting looks even weirder than usual, it's because my pen is slightly uh, broken. So I apologize in advance for, for, for that. And he broke yesterday, so I didn't really have time to change. it. And so since this functional is continuous, is bounded, we have the RIS uh, representation theorem for any Hilbert space that tells us that there exists, that for any, well, for any x. In x, there will exist a function we're going to call kx, and this is going to be a function, an element of the Hilbert space h, that uh, represents the uh, value of the functions at x via the inner product, so such that the inner product between f and kx oops, in the Hilbert space is equal to, to f of x. And so we're going to call um, this function kx will be called the, the kernel at the point x. And the function that goes from the Cartesian product of x with itself to c, given by the standard pair xy to kx of y, is just going to be a kernel. On the set X. And as a notation, we're going to say that our space H is the reproducing kernel Huber space, which kernel K, which is what this thing means. Okay, so that's all actually we're going to probably know that plus the multiplier algebra thing that we're going to define later, but this is just really the definition that we're going to use so far. And a couple of examples of such a object. Well, there are the very well-known ones, like the hard space, which is kind of the most famous, most, most uh, studied, and most known example of such a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Well, H2, the hard space, is uh, the set of all, oops, the set of all uh, holomorphic functions on the unit disk uh, that has, uh, Square summable coefficients with the natural uh, uh, inner product that arises from the definition of norms. And if that's the case, well, one can show that the, Z, the kernel of such a space is what is called the zero kernel. So kw of z is one minus w bar z. And so we're going to talk extensively later about this particular uh, space. 
Another uh, very well known and very well, uh, well studied and very important example of a reproducing kernel Hoover space is the Dirichlet space, which has something to do with the derivative of the function, of a market function in the unit disk. Indeed, we define such a space as just the function, which, has, which are holomorphic in the unit disk. And it, their derivatives uh, belong to L2 of the disk with respect to uh, the back measure. And in this case, well, one can show that the kernel is the following. So one minus um, W bar Z times the logarithm of one over one minus W Z bar. So in general, and it's a kind of a general fact, the kernel is holomorphic in Z and it's anti-analytic in W. Um, okay, another example <clears throat> of such a space is the hardest space, but in the polys now. So you can, so the first two examples that you saw are all in the disk. And the first two examples share actually something a little bit more than that. They, as, as we will see later, they both have a, the peak property, which is very important for interpolation. Whereas the hardest space on the polydisc, well, of course, is defined in the polydisc. So the polydisc uh, D to the D to me is just, you know, D copies of the uh, disc, a and part of it itself. And uh, one can define the hardest space um, basically in the same way that you can define in, 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 the, in the disk. So like the power series such that the coefficients are square summable. The only difference here is that of course, when I say N, I mean like a multi, a, a multi index in, in ND, if you want. And uh, yeah, and so in this case, the Zigo kernel on the, on, in, in the poly disk is nothing but the product of all the zero kernels in each variable. So it's one over the product from one to D of one minus W I bar Z I. And so as we will see um, later, the first two, those two first example are similar in a sense that they both have that complete that big property that will be very useful as we will see to study interpolating sequences, whereas this last one does not. And that ultimately is the reason why studying interpolating sequences in polydisc is way harder than uh, just in the disk in general. Okay, one very, very important object that one has to know if you want to do uh, study interpolating sequences using uh, over spaces is the multiplier object. So if, if you have a, a, a kernel on a, on a set X, then the, multiply, the uh, algebra of multipliers of HK is nothing but the set of all function in HK in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space with kernel K, such that if you multiply F by F phi by F, uh, that belongs to HK as well for any F. Then um, uh, an application of the closed graph theorem says that um, if that's the case, well then the multiplication by C is a bounded operator from HK to itself. And that will be the norm in this algebra of C. Here by M phi uh, is just the operator from HK to set that send F to C times F, which is linear, of course. And if P belongs to the multiplier, it's also, it's also bound. Some example of such algebras, well, if um, the kernel that you're considering are the zero kernels, both in the disk and the polydisk, then the algebra that you obtain are just H infinity. Now H infinity, and open up parentheses here, which infinity is just the set of all function uh, holomorphic in the polydisc, which are bounded. So the supremum of when z is in the polydisc of c of z 
And from now on, if, if I say just H infinity, I just mean H infinity in the disk. So when the is, 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 is equal to one. Uh, well, if HK is the Dirichlet space, on the other hand, uh, the multiplier, its multiplier algebra is contained in H infinity, but it's not all H infinity. And that's some, the first, if you want, big difference between the hardest space and the Dirichlet space. There are uh, functions which are analytic and bounded, but they don't uh, send the Dirichlet space to itself when you multiply, uh, when they act by a multiplication. And this, I think that's almost all I want to say about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces in general. So I think that we can already start talking about uh, interpolating sequences. And I'm going to start by defining <clears throat> what an interpolating sequence is for any multiplier algebra, but later we're going to really focus, at least for a while, on the case of H2, so on, on the case of interpolating sequences for H infinity. So a sequence uh, lambda in X is interpolating for the multiplier algebra of HK if, uh, well, if for any bounded sequence WN target in C, uh, there exists a function phi in the multiplier algebra, of course, such that phi of lambda N is equal to WN. And so, as you can imagine, <clears throat> being uh, Interpolating is, is a matter of how separated the sequence is, because if your sequence is separated enough, you're going to actually be able to uh, choose the value of a um, function in, in mk at one point, independently of what happened in all the other points of, of the sequences. And now, since we're going to really want to interpolate those values with a function, with holomorphic function in the multiplier algebra, the notion of separation that we're going to use depends also strongly on the multiplier algebra that we're studying, right? And so we're going to say the lambda is weakly separated if you're gonna be able to separate two points of the sequence with a function in the multipliers of uniformly bounded norm. And so by that, I mean that there exists a positive M, actually would have to be bigger than one, such that uh, for any N different than J, uh, there exists a function phi in the multiplier algebra, well, with norm uh, less than m. Yeah, I'm sorry, my hand running today is very bad. I just, okay. Uh, that, as I was saying, that separates uh, lambda n and lambda j. And by that, I mean that just it's, um, it's one lambda n and zero lambda j. And of course, this will have a very, a way nicer like characterization where we're talking about H infinity. We're gonna be able to talk about this pseudo hyperbolic matrix, but that's how you, in general, in this more general setting, you want to find the separated sequence in any, like, with respect to any multiplier algebra. And in the same way, we're gonna say that, that it's strongly separated now if you're gonna be able to separate one element of the sequence from all the others. So on the same like uh, line, you would say that there exists a positive n here, uh, such that, well, for any n in n, there exists, uh, I would say, phi n, such that phi n is in the multipliers. Its norm in the multipliers is less than n uniformly. And uh, well, phi n picks up the value uh, one at lambda n and zero elsewhere. So we can write it more compactly like that. So phi n lambda j is delta nj. Um, and so as I was saying at the beginning, the, um, the definition of the, the notion of interpolated sequence is very, very well known from like the half of the last century from Carlson in the 58 and 62. In the case, though, in which uh, x is the unit disk and uh, the multiplier algebra that we're going to consider is h infinity. So we know basically everything already about interpolating sequences for bounded analytic function. And the, like the 
main result is this, is uh, due by Carlson that proved that <clears throat> a sequence lambda in, in the unit disk is interpolating for H infinity, if and only if it is strongly separated. And so that's the, uh, that's what he, he proved in 58 in his first paper. And in 62, when he, he was in, in the paper in which he, he also proved the, uh, the Corona theorem, he also showed that <clears throat> being interpolating is equivalent to be just weakly separated and an additional condition, which is the, uh, the paper in which he defined actually those Carlson measure, which became very famous later on. And the measure mu lambda, which is uh, nothing but a weighted uh, sum of uh, delta Dirac place as the element of the sequence, and the weights are those, depends on the distance from the boundary of lambda n, is a Carlson measure. So if this measure here is a Carlson. Now, what I mean by Carlson measure, well, <clears throat> The definition that I'm going to use right now, and we're going to see some equivalent one later, more geometric one, if you want, is that, well, um, L2 with respect that measure on the unit disk in, in embed continuously in H2. Namely, the norm, the L2 norm of any F with respect to this measure is up to a constant less than the H2 norm of. That's one of the very, very much well-known definitions of being a Carlson measure in this context. And so the idea now, and the reason actually why one wants to study those revolution kernel Hilbert space and apply those to interpolation, is to extend this result to uh, a more, gen more general class of uh, algebras, like the multiplier algebras of a revolution kernel Hilbert space. So extend. this to, to other reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Yeah, when, when, when I say R, K, H, S, that's what I mean. Reproducing kernel Hilbert space, it would be very long to write it down at the time. And so with this in mind, <clears throat> I think that the, uh, we're not ready to state uh, the big property. So the big property is really what, what makes um, interpolating sequences very well treatable in, in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, I would say. And so to introduce, to define the peak property, I would probably have to uh, first state a couple of uh, facts that are always true in any reproducing kernel Hilbert space that um, really uh, justify in a certain sense why, where we want, to, we want to use the Huber um, space structure to study uh, interpolating sequences. For example, if HK is a reproducing kernel Huber space of, on X and C is in the multiplier algebra, then it's a well-known fact and it's actually not very hard to prove that if you take the, multipli the operator multiplication by C and then you take it, its adjoint, and you apply it to a kernel function. Well, what you get is just a multiple of that same kernel function. Namely, that's just phi of x bar times kx. And this might, it's kind of easy to prove. You just take the product, the hint in the product of the left hand side with any function in hk, and then you move the joints, you use the um, reproducing property, and you're basically done. But it's extremely, extremely important for uh, anyone that wants to study interpolating sequences from this new point of view. Because what it says is that if you have, for example, a multiplier, uh, here that shouldn't be infinity, that should be mk. If you have a multiplier with norm less than one, by that's just a um, normalization factor. That's not very important. But if you have a multiplier with non less than one that sends any lambda n to some target sequence wn, well, then you can kind of translate that in a more 
uh, operator theory viewpoint. So by using the Euclidean geometry of the, of the um, Hilbert space. Well, that means that if you uh, consider the operator M phi star going from the span of all those linear, those, those kernel functions to itself, That sends uh, <clears throat> again k lambda n to uh, w n bar times k of lambda n. This is bounded. This is a co co contraction, actually. Because of this, because in, in this case, phi of x will just be. Uh, WN by assumptions here. And so we see that if there exists such a multiplier that does this interpolating job, then you have this operator, this contraction between span of linear functions. Now, <clears throat> the converse is not always true. It's not true in any revolution kernel Hilbert space, but it's true for some of them. And when that happens, we say that that, kernel, that um, Hilbert space has the big property. So HK will have the peak property if um, <clears throat> if uh, for any oops if for any like sequence lambda and uh, for n t and a contraction t let's say such that T goes from those uh, linear combination of kernel function to itself. That sends, I guess, um, the nth kernel function to just a multiple of it. Then there exists actually a multiplier phi in uh, mk in the multiply algebra such that, uh, well, we can say that t is nothing but the restriction on those kernels of the adjoint of the multiplication by phi. Uh, that's one way that you can see that. So it's kind of an expansion property. So you start with an, an operator on some kernel function, and you're able to extend it to all the kernel, the uh, Hilbert space. So in particular, that means that this uh, phi, which actually has to have norm less than one, I didn't say that. So phi not only exists, but has norm less than one, and phi of uh, lambda n is exactly Wn. And so this phi does your interpolation job. In a certain sense. So if you have the peak property, you can also we can actually focus not only not in all the Hilbert space, but just on the kernels of your sequence. And in particular, when you study Nebelina peak interpolation, which is done by uh, finally many nodes, that's even like more useful because you can start with only finally many kernels and you get some a multiplier that is defined in uh, in all your yeah, um, multiplication, the, an, an operator then they define on all your Hilbert space. And as regard which um, spaces had that property, well, we can show that H2 does have it. So the hard space has the complete, has, has the peak property. The Dirichlet kernel also has it. But uh, the hard space on the polydisc does it. And that, again, one of the reasons why uh, those uh, studying, we know way less about interpolating sequences in the bodies, in the tridies, and so on, than we do on, uh, on, the, on the disk. And so um, one uh, important thing that this uh, peak property allows us to do, in my opinion, is the following. So it tells us that this um, notion of separation between points in X that we saw before, this made by holomorphic functions, 
can be translated in a certain sense in uh, the geometry of the hard space. In particular, um, it is equivalent of stating that the angle between the kernel function is kind of bounded below by some constant. And to justify what I just said, let me just say that, well, if there exists, if you have two points x and y in x and a multiplier that separates them, so its norm is less than some number m, and it's one at, at, at x and it's zero at y. Well, then by the peak property, that's equivalent to saying that the function, well, the operator, t, that goes from the span of kx and ky to itself. So here, you're really considering just a operator between a two-dimensional Hilbert space, so C2, if you want, to itself, that sends Kx to itself and Ky to zero, well, this operator has to have norm less than n. And, and again, the forward implication is obvious, and the other implication is due to the big property. And so really, if you look at this like second statement here, that can be completely translated in the Hilbert space geometry by just saying that the angle between Kx and Ky is, uh, is bigger than one over M. So the sign, when I say the sign between Kx and Ky, I just mean the sign on the angle between uh, Kx and Ky. And so you start from a notion of separation, which is just stated in terms of holomorphic functions. So for example, in the disk can be stated with respect to the pseudo hyperbolic geometry of, of the disk. And you get to something that it's really just uh, like uh, <clears throat> a con condition on the angle between those kernel functions. And in particular, like what I want to spend some time talking about now is how this like correspondence is even nicer when you're in the uh, in the disk. So if we're considering H infinity. And that's because, um, well, we have a lot of function theory for bounded holomorphic function. We know a lot about them. And in particular, one thing that we know is that if you have a sequence W, and if you have a function S bounded and, and holomorphic that vanishes at all the points of W, at all those WN, which is not identically zero. Now, you can say that that's not always possible, but when, when it's possible, when W is such that such an S exists, then we can factorize S. And in particular, we can say that S is equal to some Blaschke product, the W times G. And in particular, we also know that the uh, H infinity norm of G is equal to the one of X. That's a very classic and extremely, extremely important theorem because it makes, um, how can I say that? He makes uh, the study of, of interpolating sequences in the disk for H infinity even easier, even like, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And so if, 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 if you see any proof of Carlson's theorem, at a certain point, they will use uh, those Blaschke factors. Where, I didn't say BW as well. BW is, is defined to be the product of a certain number of Blaschke factors. So, well, if those are infinitely many, you just have to correct it, I guess. So you have to add this to fix any problem of conversions at zero, for example, but those are your Blaschke factor. And what you're doing is that you're just multiplying them all together and you get B, uh, <clears throat> BW. Okay, and in particular, what this says is that, well, any function that vanishes at the sequence W, it's a multiple of this BW, okay? Which, say, which says that um, if you take the, uh, the linear span of all 
uh, those kernel function and the point of that sequence. And you close it because if there are infinitely many, you might want to close it just to be sure. Well, <clears throat> that's what we call a model space. So it's the orthogonal component in H2 of all the multiples of BW. Because of, of course, uh, yeah, because this set here, BW times H2, is the set of all the functions that vanishes at at uh, at W. And so, if you take its orthogonal component, you 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 will get by the reproducing properties of the kernel, just the linear span of the kernels at the sequence. And Okay, so in particular, what, one thing that, that, that is true about those model spaces is that if you want to compute the distance, so the sign of the angle between uh, a normalized kernel, Kz. So when I say, when I put the at on top of a vector, I mean that I'm just normalizing it, divided by this norm. And the span of uh, all those well, yes. kernel function here. That's just the absolute value of the Blaschke factor at Z. And that's, I think it's a very, very nice uh, equality because on the left-hand side, you have something that depends exclusively on the geometry of your Hilbert space. On the right-hand side, on the other hand, you have something that as we will see in a little bit, it's very helpful to de define what it's called the uh, pseudo hyperbolic matrix distance in the unit disk. So you see how those two kind of geometries talk to each other in a certain sense, as we saw before in general for any big kernel. And so really that gives you um, uh, two ways to see basically the same notion of distance. And so that's very helpful when you wanna try to solve problems because you have two different um, way to think about the same object. And in particular, as a corollary, the, uh, the sign, of, so the distance or the sign of those angles in the, uh, of those ziggle kernels, in, in, in a certain sense, factorizes. What I mean by that is that if you consider, if you consider the sign of the angle between a normalized kernel at Z and all the kernels, sorry, just can do better than that. And all the, and the subspace gen generated by the kernels at the WNs and you re remove the J one, well, you can just do the following. So that's equal to the, uh, the distance, the sign of the angle between KZ and all the kernels but the jth one times times this, times the distance from KZ to the jth one, which should be WJ. So in a certain sense, yeah, those this distances between kernel functions factorizes. And that's something that is absolutely unique and specific about the Zico kernel. That's not true in, as far as I know, in any other reproducing kernel Uber space, but there might be some examples. In particular, now finally, since <clears throat> I claim that that's gonna, that was gonna be a geometric talk, I'm finally gonna give you some picture which makes things nicer. Uh, well, you can define, as I was uh, kind of uh, um, saying, before the pseudo hyperbolic distance in the unit disk given two points Z and W as the absolute value of the Blaschke factor at W evaluated at, at Z. And now, <clears throat> thanks to that uh, factorization theorem that we saw here, uh, here, that's kind of the same notion of distance that we saw at the very beginning when we use a holomorphic function or function in the multiplier algebra to separate points. Because that's exactly 
the supremum of what? Of the absolute value of phi of z, where phi is in h infinity, has normal less than one, and it vanishes at w. So you take any function that vanishes at w, which has norm h infinity norm, which is bounded by one in the, in the unit disk. And among all those functions, you take the one that gets, that has the highest possible value at, uh, at z. And that's going to be exactly your Blaschke factor at w. And so by <clears throat> the peak property in the Hurley space, uh, this distance here, that now has a very nice in geometric meaning, mostly thanks to, thanks to this, this uh, zero hyperbolic distance is nothing but the sign on the angle between those two kernel functions. If you want to normalize them. And so here, that's what this picture is, is, is trying to say. In the disk, you can see at this zero hyperbolic distance with these nice geodesic, which are orthogonal to the boundary of the unit disk. And that, and this is going to be your zero hyperbolic distance. On the other hand, though, you can see that as just a very like geometric and visible in Euclidean, even two-dimensional uh, picture. So you just take two kernel function, and that's and this distance is exactly the same. So the distance between those two kernel functions is exactly the zero hyperbolic distance from zero to w in, uh, in the disk. And in particular, since uh, those pseudo hyperbolic distances factorize in a certain sense, in the sense that we saw before, now try to consider a three dimensional picture. So you have W1 and W2 here, and uh, point Z. Now you can consider the distance from Z to W1, the distance from W1 to W2, or also you can consider the distance from Z to the plane spanned by W1 and W2. And you can ask yourself if those three quantities relate to themselves. And in this case, for the Zico kernel, so in H2, the, those kind of, yeah, they, they, they do, because the length of the red segment, so which is the absolute value of B, of the Blaschke factor at W1, W2, of Z, it's equal to the product of the two green ones. So, so something very uh, specific happens. So in general, if you're in any Hilbert space, it is not true at, at, at all that the distance from one point to the span of two more vectors is the product of the corresponding distances. Well, what's happening here is that that's the case for kernel function in the uh, Hardy space. And so, uh, well, before I was kind of saying that you can use the Euclidean geometry of the Hardy spaces to solve problems in the uh, for holomorphic function. Well, this is an example of when you can go actually backwards because knowing something about, in this case, the factorization uh, theorem in H infinity tells you how the Ziegel kernels are distributed in a certain sense. In, uh, in the Hardy space, because he, this uh, equality here in particular tells you that if, if KZ uh, happens to be close to that plane, to the plane generated by KW1 and KW2, then he cannot approach that plane on, a, um, on whichever point. If he have approached that, it means that uh, this red quantity is small. And therefore, one of those two, so it goes to zero in a certain sense. And therefore, one of the two green quantities here has to go to zero, which means that a zero kernel is a, a, approaches this span of two more zero kernels only if it actually approaches one of the two, which, of course, that's not the case in general for any Hubler space. And so, with this in mind, so what happened here that for the zero kernel, this theory of model spaces helps a lot to understand this uh, 
correspondence between Euclidean geometry on one side and uh, hyper hyperbolic geometry on the other. Well, one can do the same actually whenever you have the big property. Uh, what time should I stop, Chris? Uh, I started like five minutes later. So can I go up to like 55 or I should stop at 50? Um, no, that, that's fine. Just just um, take as long as you need, so long as it's it's reasonable. Maybe, okay. um, yeah, nine. Stop me and go to, to long, okay. So in general, in any kernel uh, separated, uh, in, in, in any peak kernels, what happens is that your, uh, a sequence lambda is weakly separated. If and only if you can, so you, you can translate this weak separation on the kernel. So if and only if uh, the infimum for any pairs of n different than j of the signs of the angles between k lambda n and k lambda j is positive. And in the same way, is strongly separated if uh, for any n. Uh, the sign of the angle between um, the nth kernel and the span of all the other kernels is uniformly bounded below. <clears throat> and so, I, again, as for the hard space, you see this double way to see at distances, uh, like separation in those kind of kernels. But there is another way that you can state that a sequence of vectors is spread out in any Hilbert space, actually, which is the notion of a uh, risk system, which is kind of a quasi orthogonality notion. If you're in a Hilbert space and you take a sequence Xn, that, that sequence will be a risk system if the norm in H of any linear combination of those Xn's. Is comparable to the L2 norm of the coefficient. I should have put C square here, and one over C square. And in particular, if oops, in particular, if only this right hand side inequality holds, we say that Xn is, is a Bessel system. Why am I talking about Bessel systems now? Because it turns out that the uh, that the Carlson measure condition that we saw at the beginning in Carlson theorem can be stated in terms of those Bessel systems. In particular, we can see that <clears throat> uh, there are a very nice and geometric definition of Carlson measure in the unit disk, which is the one described by this picture, that says that whenever you uh, take a Carlson box. So you just take a uh, tau, an element of the unit circle, uh, positive number r, which is the length of the unit circle. You construct the square inside the circle. And then being a Carlson measure for mu lambda says that the measure of that box, mu lambda of what I call here s of tau r is uh, less up to a constant to R. And in this case, be aware that saying mu lambda of that box, given that our special definition of mu lambda, which is this, just means that I'm just counting those quantities. So the distances between lambda and the boundaries, sorry, not really. So, yeah, like this when lambda n happens to enter that box. So that's, if you want a very nice and geometric uh, hy hyperbolic way to uh, see at this, at, at those measures, because those are nothing that the, oops, that the distance is from the boundary. Well, that it turns out to be equivalent to the fact that the kernel, the Zico kernel, Um, are a Bessel system in H2. In the hardest space, uh, whose multiplier algebra is exactly H infinity. And so this gives us a way to think of Carlson measures 
not only for H2 and for H infinity, but in, in, indeed for any reproducing kernel through the Hoover space, if you want. And so with this in mind, one can extend Collison theorem now to any reproducing kernel Hoover space with the big property by saying that lambda will be interpolating if and only if uh, the sequence of kernel functions, actually of normalized kernel functions, here I should have said that before as well, is a risk system. And the equivalence between one and two is just basically the application of the peak property that I was doing before. And uh, the third equivalent condition is just saying that lambda is weakly separated. And instead of Carlson measure, we we're just going to say that k lambda n, the normalized Zigo kernel are a Bessel system. And here, there is one, uh, one condition that is missing, if you remember Carlson's theorem, which is the one with, say, strong separation. But we know that for strong separation, this theorem does, does not extend. So we know that, for example, in, in the Dirichlet space, which we remember, it has the complete, the, the peak property. Uh, there are sequences that are strongly separated, but not interpolating. So in general, being interpolating implies being strongly separated. But the contrary is not true. And that was proved by Marshall and Sonberg, I think, in 94, if I remember correctly. And now one last thing that I wanted to mention before I done is the following. So the equivalence well, the equivalence between three and two for the peak kernels is highly not trivial. And it was proved only last year in 2019 by uh, McCarthy, uh, Richter, Hart, and Alleman. <clears throat> and in particular, the equivalence between three and two is not true in general for any Hilbert space. And one can cook up a very easy counterexample. So you can find in any Huber space, a sequence of vectors which are a Bessel system are weakly separated, but they are not a risk system. And in particular, in this case, you can just choose uh, a orthonormal basis, EN, of a Huber space, H. So that's an orthonormal basis of H. And define your X. I uh, are as follows. So x1 will be e1, x2 will be e2. And then if you consider a sequence gamma n that converges to zero, you just take x3 to be uh, in the span of x1, e1, e2, and e3, but that approaches this plane here by e1 and e2 in the middle in a certain sense, which is ex ex exactly the, the, the situation that I was saying that it's not possible for the zero kernels before. And then you go in the orthogonal complement, that's what this thing says, and you do the, the, the same. And then you make the third vector approaching the plane at when n goes to infinity. And so, uh, well, yeah, this is a weakly separated sequence because the distance between two, any two, two vectors is at, at most, I guess, one over root two. It's a Bessel system because it's almost orthogonal, but um, the Bessel constant here, I guess it can be by B3 and you're going to be fine. But it's not a, um, a risk system because <clears throat> the distance between any vector and the span of all the others is going to zero. And so what this counterexample says that the thing that I was saying for the Zigo kernel before that if a kernel function goes to the span of two more, then he has to approach one of the two kernel functions directly. It's also true with, for any kernel with a big property. So that's kind of a nice way to say the study of homomorphic functions said also something about the, ge the Euclidean geometry of those uh, Hilbert spaces that we're using to get more information on those uh, interpolating problems. So I guess it's time for me to stop talking. And if you have any questions, I will be more than uh, glad to answer them. Thank you.
Thank you, Alberto.